You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Into the Deep by Tanya Brown Performed by Otis Gyre The ocean is alive, Captain Hilbert said. Jeffries looked up at him and nodded, unsure what brought about this sudden comment. When the captain awoke in the dead of night and dressed, Jeffries did the same, like any loyal cabin boy should. When Hilbert took to the deck, Jeffreys fell in beside his master. When Hilbert went silent and stared out across the deep, Jeffreys did likewise. And there the pair of them stood on the bow of the ship, staring at the moonlit waters below in total silence for almost an hour. The ocean is alive, the captain repeated, and one is mistaken to believe otherwise. Yes, sir. Jeffreys said, not because it was expected of him, or because he agreed. He said it because he really didn't know what else to say. It's a well-known fact, rarely disputed, never disproved. After all, over two hundred thousand aquatic species can't be wrong. The captain paused here, and Jeffreys thought he heard a bit of humor return to the old man. Nine out of every ten living things do their living in the ocean. It is common knowledge that the ocean is alive. Yes, sir, Jeffreys repeated. But what is alive in the ocean? And the young man's blood ran cold at the sound of his master's question. It wasn't the words themselves, though they were ominous enough. What gave Jeffreys pause was in how the captain said it, the tone he employed, the underlying dread. What was alive in the ocean? What indeed? Jeffreys swallowed hard and ventured. Two hundred thousand aquatic species? The captain turned and looked down very slowly until the man's half-gaze landed square on Jeffreys, the dark and gutted depths of Hilbert's right eye socket seemed to glare at the cabin boy far harder than the clear and healthy left eye, as if the ruined eye saw something a good eye couldn't, or shouldn't. You can jest all you like, young Jeffreys, the captain said, but it doesn't change the truth of the matter. Which is? Jeffreys realized he was treading choppy waters, nearing a kind of back sass which was not tolerated on Hilbert's crew. Yet he also knew his master's tone, and tonight the captain all but begged the prompting, as if he wanted to get something off his chest, and considering how very broad that chest was, the something must have been enormous. Hilbert sighed, long and low, before he looked out to the water again, Beyond the calculated and the counted, the captured and the catalogued, we just don't know. We are only allowed to see what's just under her surface, the fish, the flora, the fauna. We can only see so far down, and beyond that there is... there is so much more. There are places in the ocean the hand of man has yet to touch, deep, Dark places human beings have yet to reach. Places alive with such things the human mind has yet to conceive. Much like the human mind, young Jeffreys, the ocean holds many unexplored depths. Yes, sir, Jeffreys said with a slight touch of awe in his voice. As a boy of fourteen, with a limited education, he had never heard such philosophizing in all of his young life. They returned to watching the water in silence. It was then that Jeffreys noticed, for the first time, that the surface beyond the moving ship was eerily calm. In the way it was calm before a storm, yet there was no evidence of a coming storm. The stars were bright as a lamplighter's wick, the moon threatening to burst her seams, 
she hung so full in the clear sky. The maid of hardship was well prepared for a sudden storm, for she had seen all manner of wave and wind. Even so, the waters beyond those churning under her hull were tranquil to the point of glassy stillness, which was sure to mean something. Jeffreys just didn't know what that something could be. Another few minutes passed when the captain said, I awoke because I had dreams. He covered his face with a huge, powerful hand before he added, I have suffered from nightmares. Jeffreys froze again. This was unfamiliar ground. The living nature of the ocean might have been common knowledge to the saltiest of dogs, but even those who kept to the land knew someone in a power position should never admit to a weakness such as nightmares. Nightmares were for children, little children. Nightmares were not fit for men like Hilbert. In fact, to the best of Jeffrey's knowledge, captains did not have nightmares. I call them nightmares, Hilbert said without looking away from the smooth surface of the water, but I believe they are better understood as omens. Ill omens. Well, then, that was better. Omens and portents were the way of the sea. The ocean spoke to those who plied their trade by her, allowing them a certain amount of sight not normally permitted the average man. And for Jeffreys, an omen was much better than a nightmare, even if it was ill. My ship, the captain started, but paused as if the words pained him to say it out loud. He steadied himself and finished with, The maid will go down tonight. No! Jeffrey shouted. He quickly amended his untoward outburst with, I think, I should think not, sir. The maid is as sound as any vessel that ever took to the sea. Sounder! I appreciate your faith in my craft. But I have seen it, my lad. It has been etched into my very brain, like a memory so clear, so vivid, as if it has already happened. Hilbert never once looked away from the waters as he spoke. He kept his single working eye trained on the unnaturally calm surface, as if searching for something. A whisper in the darkness, an echo of things done. The maid will sink tonight, and take all aboard with her to watery graves. Jeffreys may have been just a lad, but he knew the truth when he heard it, even when the truth sounded unbelievable. Well, then we should make ready, sir. If you feel you've been granted warning, then we should prepare. It is too late, Hilbert whispered. Nothing will prepare us for what is to come. We are already damned. Dead men sailing to our own tombs. The statue said as much. Statue, sir? Geoffrey said, supremely confused by this turn of discussion. What on earth was the captain talking about? Of course you haven't seen it, Hilbert said. An exquisite work of art like that is too far valuable to expose to just anyone. The captain gave another wistful sigh. And the things it says, my boy, the things it tells me, just me, because it knows I'm the only one who can handle the truth. I am the only one who can appreciate it. I am the only one that is ready. The captain's words sounded less and less like an old sailor with a little second sight, and more like a man who had spent far too long under the hot sun and salty air. Sir, Jeffreys touched his captain's shoulder. Perhaps you should return to bed. The captain whipped around and bore down on Jeffreys with such ferocity, such anger, that it took everything Jeffreys had not to jump overboard just to escape his terrible one-eyed gaze. 
Through clenched teeth, the man spat his words. We are damned, do you hear me, lad? We cannot escape our fate. For he has showed me the way of things. It is already done. He has made it so. Who? Jeffries asked with the last ounce of strength he possessed. Captain Hilbert didn't answer. He didn't need to. The look in that single eye was enough to answer a thousand questions. Well, that, and, the slim black appendage that rose from the calm water's surface somewhere behind the captain. The thing curved and swayed, flicking back and forth in the night air as it felt about. Heaven help us, Jeffrey said softly as the giant tentacle was joined by several more. Heaven will not have the likes of us, the captain said. Neither will hell. Not after he is done with us. The deep is the only place for us now, lad. Down in the darkness. Down in the void. With him. The feelers touched the ship tentatively at first, like the unsure caress of a new lover. They snaked along her hull, her bow, her mast her rails, becoming bolder as they grew more familiar with her shape and form. One drew very close to Jeffreys, who remained glued to the spot with fear rather than attempting escape. It rose above him as if evaluating him, casting its undulating shadow over the trembling boy. At first Jeffreys assumed that it was a limb of a giant squid of legend. It was wrong. There was no color to the thing, no suckers upon its surface, no sign of life within or without. Smooth and dark, as black as deepest night, the tentacle emanated a cold so strong young Jeffrey's skin went blue in all the places that just the shadow of the thing fell upon. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid, sir, Jeffrey stammered. Good the captain said. His anger fled in that moment, and he smiled so wide. The act of it must have pained him. In all of their days together, Jeffreys had never seen the captain do more than smirk. Smiling, Hilbert once purported, was a pleasure reserved for the common man. Captain Gilbert had said, Do not smile. Yet now the man wore a lunatic's grin, as bright as the moon and just as full. You should be afraid, the captain whispered. We should be all terribly afraid. A whisk rose from the slithering limbs as they drew taut across the ship. There then came a creak of salt-aged wood, followed by a slight shift in the balance of the deck. Though it seemed impossible, the captain smiled even wider, his maniacal grin threatening to split his face open, perhaps in an attempt to release the continuing swell of his madness. Jeffreys heard someone scream from far off, blood-curdling and soul-splitting. This was followed by another, and another. Thick and fast there came a chorus of painful shouts and fearful shrieks. Bedlam had never produced so fine a tune that rose from the sudden madness around them. Young Jeffreys opened his mouth to join the choir, but drew in an icy lungful of seawater instead. Captain Hilbert went down with his ship, for he never moved, never wavered, and never stopped grinning. <laughs>